The scriptures that you have had read in your presence today prepare you for what you are about to receive, and may it be to you a blessing. We started in Revelation, and we will finish in Revelation today because I want you to see two pictures. The first is the fact that we're in court. How many of you have ever been in court? Okay, let's see again. How many of you have ever been just observing? Oh, wasn't that nice? How many of you have uh, been the defendant? The accused. Okay, how, how many of you uh, have, have, have actually gone to court because you wanted somebody else to pay? All right, well done. Okay, that's the, the laws of the land allow us to go to court and ask a judge to, to judge between us as to whether or not what we are asking is fair, whether it is according to the law. And uh, that's uh, what I hear on television uh, a bit these days is that people are paying attention to, or in some cases not paying attention to, the rule of law. Okay, so the times I've gone to court have usually revolved around <clears throat> going too fast um, in, in my car. Uh, and uh, so on Soledad Canyon, uh, I just want to warn you, uh, there is a man on a motorcycle that does hide. Uh, I have not met him personally yet. I know some who have. Uh, no names will be mentioned at this time. The guilty shall remain anonymous. However, there's a very large sign on Soledad Canyon advertising the services of a lawyer who says, don't pay it. Why? Why, why does he say this? Because he does not want you to have to pay the full price. He wants to have your services so that he can get your your sentence reduced and then you won't have to pay so much then there's the fine print you know you must always look for the, Matthew always look for the fine print because it says beginning at ninety nine dollars <laughs> so you know that you're at least going to have to pay ninety nine but maybe if you're faced with you know three hundred or something ninety nine looks good it, it looks like a deal right so you're gonna call him up and he's gonna get you and, and, and you're going to pay him $99 and then the court, whatever else. I don't know how that system works. But there is that available to you here in wonderful, amazing Santa Clarita. No amens to that? You're not saying amen? Yes, we're in Santa Clarita. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell the people down at City Hall you're only so-so impressed with living in Santa Clarita. Some of you have lived here a long time. Some of you, like me, have lived here only a short time. And uh, what we perceive is that this is a town that loves families, that loves uh, the, the opportunity of raising kids uh, in, in a nice environment. And so therefore, there are lots of playing fields and there are lots of hikes and there are lots of things to do. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. It was kind of like Elimelech and his family in their wonderful home in Bethlehem. Um, you'll hear me say this a number of times. It is a Hebrew word, Beit Lechem. And you say, that, well, what is that? Beit means house. And Lechem is bread. So now you know that there's another sermon coming later on, or you can write the sermon yourself. You can associate the fact that Bethlehem is the birthplace of who? Jesus. And then later on he said, I am the bread of life. Kind of cool that that matches, huh? I come from the house of bread and I am the bread of life. It all matches. Believe me, the more you study, you're going to find it all matches. Okay? And, and I don't know, there's some of us... We just get tingly when things match, okay? They don't, you know, uh, my, my daughter, she likes certain cars, uh, and I'm so proud of her for liking cars because I like cars. She has a particular car, and then they made another one. John Hinkle has that car, only he has the newer one, which they put two backup lights on. The fact that the previous version only had one backup light 
really bothered my daughter. I don't know why. But she likes things that match. She likes things that go in place. She would be happy to know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that he also said, I am the bread of life. But Elimelech and his family were also living in Bethlehem. He was of the tribe of Judah who were based out of Bethlehem and he left. And he went to live in the neighboring uh, country that was part of the, 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 the larger story of the Israelite people, descendants of Abraham actually relatives of Abraham and if you want extracurricular activity it is NC 17 rated but you can read the story of Abraham and his nephew Lot say no more we have young people present okay however Moab and Ammon were the two countries adjacent to Israel and whatever happened in Israel was bad enough that he decided to move his family away. He moves his family from Santa Clarita right down to Watts. What, you didn't say amen? You didn't say bad thing? Why, why would we say that? I don't know. I'm not from LA, so you can tell me whether what I said just now was bad or good or... I don't know. But it's not Santa Clarita, right? So then he has teenage children and it's come time now that they should get married. And so the two boys, Mahlon and Kilian or Chilion, choose wives in the area who are both Moabites people. They're descendants of Moab. And they get married. They're there long enough that something happens. I don't know if it was Moabite fever or what, but dad dies, Marlon dies, and Kilian dies. So the men die. Ladies, it's terrible to tell you this, but the Bible is full of the results of sin. And as I told you before in the series where we're talking about how God protects us and how we talked when it was Woman's Day, Mother's Day, about the fact that, that woman might just be the humanity's best friend. The idea being that she is protective, she is she is involved, she has thoughts that she was equal to her husband when they were first created, but that after creation he showed his dominance by naming her. Whoa, man. Well, he named her Eve, mother of all. <laughs> that, that was his reaction before sin. <laughs> what are you saying? Paul is, Paul is saying that, that when he exclaimed, whoa, man, but that was a sinful act. No, 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 no. I think that was definitely God-inspired. Uh, his reaction to what, had, what was happening and what would happen, uh, which, of course, he didn't know at that moment, but God uh, sure showed him that night um, and then gave him a wedding present. What's the wedding present that God gave? Sabbath. Sabbath, exactly. Sabbath is God's wedding present, and it began on their wedding night. So... Did you enjoy your wedding present last night? The evening and the morning, that's how God's time works. So your rest, by the way, last night was the beginning of your Sabbath. Just that, that was a free thing, that was, that was just free. So your Friday night rest, if you don't take it, it's like God giving you a gift and you saying, ah, don't need it. Anyway, they die. These boys die. And, and, and in, the, in that day, in Bible times, you can read that, that you had to, ladies, you had to be connected to a man. You had to be connected to a man in order to have standing in society. Today, we, we think of giving our daughters away. Do we ever talk about giving our sons away. So it's still part of our society. I want you to know that my wife and I have enticed uh, my daughter's future parents-in-law to join us at her wedding in giving their son away to our daughter as we give our daughter away 
to their son. And so we're going to walk our daughter down the aisle and they're going to walk their son down the aisle. I'd say that's more 21st century, but it's also more biblical before sin. Okay? But we're dealing with Elimelech, and, and, and he's dead now, and Marlon's dead, and Chilean's dead, and, and so Naomi decides she's not going to stay in Moab anymore. She leaves, she goes home, and on the way home, she tells the girls, look, you, you should go back to your mother's house. You should, you should remarry. Go find another guy and have a great life. It was a wonderful blessing and it was a wonderful release. She did not have to do that. She gives them the opportunity and one of them, Orpah, she takes her up on it. The other one, Ruth, decides to make a, an, an amazing declaration that since then has been used again and again and again in wedding services. Either a man saying it to his wife or a wife saying it to her husband. Wherever you go, wherever you lodge, I will be there with you. Your God, now this was very interesting because the gods between Moab and, and, and Israel were different. Your God will be my God. I will be known as, as the person who, 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 who follows your God. In other words, your legal system, which is from your God, will be my legal system. And that's important because, because that's where we're headed today. We get there, and as you heard scripture being read to you today, I hope you, hope you, you heard it. If, you, if, if not, read it again. See it with your eyes because hearing it, seeing it, maybe even writing it helps you to remember it. They had a court appearance ahead of them. Naomi knows this. Ruth does not. All Ruth knows is that now she is completely dependent upon Naomi's knowledge of her society. And so she goes ahead and trusts Naomi when Naomi gives her instructions. She instructs her daughter-in-law to go and to glean. Now, it seems from what Ruth says that she understood the system. It was a, a part of the legal society of Israel that those who did not have were allowed to go and glean. It's a lovely word. Uh, it rhymes with clean. And it kind of had the same effect in the sense that the harvesters would go. You heard the, the children's story a moment ago how they would gather the the rice together and then they would cut the heads off the rice stalks and just leave the stalks behind. Well, the harvesters in Bible times had sickles, uh, those sickles that you see today on flags of countries far away like the Federation that's in the news these days. You know, those sickles are ancient. They've been used, those knives are ancient and they have, have been around and that's how they've been cutting grain for centuries, for millennia even. And then they would take the tops off, they would winnow the grain, etc. They would leave the stalks. This, this, these, these sheaves would drop, some of the grain would drop. Now, in a harvest situation, uh, as a landowner, as a, as a person who owned this, you wanted your harvesters to be very careful. So it is very interesting that Boaz says to his harvesters, I want you to be sloppy. Very interesting. So keep, keep that in your mind. So he, he has his eye on her. He notices her. He then tells her that she's going to be safe. He tells her not to go to any other field to, to glean. You're allowed to pick up what the harvesters don't pick up. That is your right. And in fact, he makes sure that she has plenty. I want you to know that this, this system in Israel was and uh, should be looked at as the grace of God. That there, that there was going to be enough. Remember when Jesus says, I come to bring you life and it's going to be so abundant that it's just going to overflow? Well, if you want a picture in the Old Testament of this exact concept, this is it. 
I'm going to bless you so much that you won't be able to pick up everything that I put down. It's going to overflow and it's going to bless other people. So part of the blessings of God was picked up by Ruth. And she comes back with her shawl. She comes back with her shawl absolutely overflowing with grain. And Naomi knows I was right. Ladies, grandmothers, don't you, don't you just love it when you're right? You, you put a plan into place and, and you knew exactly what needed to be done and your daughter or your daughter-in-law listened to you and it was the right thing to do and everything went right. Oh, you feel so good. I think that's how Naomi felt. And day after day, Ruth went back. Well, we're skipping the middle piece because we've already mentioned it and it's kind of, it's kind of strange, but it's how Ruth let Boaz know that she knows that he has uh, uh, the right to claim her. Because that's where we want to be today. Let's just say after that night meeting, Ruth goes home, this time with a shawl full of grain that she didn't pick up because she had met Boaz at the threshing floor and she had had a conversation with him and at the end he said, don't go home empty-handed and he took, the Bible says, six measures. Now, I don't know what that measure, it was big enough that her shawl was so full that it looked like a hiker's backpack in Europe and, he, and here she goes home to Naomi that morning and Naomi knows. And so she says to Ruth, he is not going to rest until he has settled the matter. And that's what happens next. So uh, if you have a buckle on your shoe at this moment, uh, a laces, uh, you, you need to untie them. Just one. Okay? Don't do it immediately and you're thinking, oh my goodness, I have uh, dirty, no. You, you probably have clean socks on or no socks, ladies, I understand. But just get it ready because we're going to just play a game in a moment. Boaz knows that there is one person, there is one person who has a closer relationship by blood. Very important that this is known as a blood relationship. There is one person who is closer to Naomi by blood. And so he contacts that guy and says, look, I have a desire to have Ruth as my wife. With her comes Naomi and all the land that belonged to our brother Elimelech and then was going to be given to his two sons. But of course we know that they died in Moab. And the, the, the guy says, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. I already have a wife. I really don't need the land. And so he says, you take her. And I don't know that the conversation was probably any longer than that. Maybe there was some tea. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Whatever happened, the next thing that happened was that Boaz said, well, do you want to go to the city gate? Now, it's interesting that the story takes us to the city gate. The gate of a city is the place where things are allowed to go in and go out. It is the place that can be closed and things can be kept out or things can be kept in. This was the place that the, the elders would go. This was the place where the honored citizens would go and they would sit in council and they would be the ones to whom individuals would bring their uh, legal problems. It was the court. And so to this place, Boaz and his relative come and they propose the situation. Boaz says, I really like Ruth, I want to marry her. And, and, and I, I want to claim her uh, with Naomi and everything that goes along. And, uh, but this guy here, he has a, a closer claim. So this guy speaks up and says, I renounce my claim 
and I would like to give Boaz the right to redeem. Now I want to thank Eric because he chose this particular song, 343. Do you remember singing that a moment ago? Or didn't you pick up your hymnal? That's okay, that's all right. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross. Okay, that's jumping ahead. That's picture number two because we're still with picture number one. Because then they did what, what, what I, I, I want you to think about doing. When was the last time you took your shoes off in church? We're, we're not a Muslim mosque. So you don't see a lot of shoes outside. But if we were a mosque, you would see all of our shoes outside. There you go. Take off your shoes for where on you stand is holy ground. So at the gate, at the place where things are decided as to whether or not they are in or out, whether or not they are legal, these men take off their shoes because they are making a solemn vow. This is, this is the sign. And they, trade, they trade shoes, you know. I don't think I can wear Milt's shoes, and I don't think he can wear mine. But if we were to make a deal, you know, that would be what we'd have to do back in those days. He traded shoes. This is where I walk. This is what holds me up. This is what protects, this is what protects my feet. I'm going to give it to you, and you're going to give me yours. So I have your protection, and you have mine. I want to think of the next, and this is, this is where it gets really interesting and where I feel like God asked me to tell you today to connect these two things that I've never connected before in my life. Let's go back to Revelation, shall we? Because I want you to see how these two things, how these two things fit together because it's, it's pretty freaky and amazing to me that... I've never seen this before, but here you have in the first verses of the book of Revelation, which by the way, Revelation 1.1 1, 1 says what? Revelation, Revelation. Revelation of? Jesus. Jesus Christ. This is not John's revelation. This is John who does the revealing, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the God uh, that, that God gave his servants he, that you must know uh, by sending his angel to his servant John. So John testifies to the revelation of Jesus Christ. But let's go down and uh, look at this. Verse uh, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Now I'm at... Uh, I uh, met a man at the, at, at the club, his name was Sean, and I decided not to call him Sean of the Dead, I decided to call him Sean of the Living, because he was a trainer, an instructor on healthful living. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is his name. He's the firstborn of the dead. What is important? Why is it important that he be the firstborn of the dead? Because you see, my friends, there was another hill, there was another gate, there was another time in which a deal was struck. And there was a death that was needed. There was blood that was needed in order to strike that deal. So I want you to be thinking the gate where Boaz and his relative are striking this deal and then I want you to see that the same kind of deal was struck on that day when Jesus walked up that hill. Staggered more like. And then was nailed to the cross and died. And then on the third day as he predicted rose from the grave to assume his new identity. King of the world. You see, there had been one who had been making a claim on you and I. 
one who was closer in the sense that he was a and is a created being. So there had to be one who came who was, a, who was also a blood relative. So are you seeing the reason why it is important that we believe that Jesus is 100% human and 100% God at the same time? If he was not 100% human, he would not qualify. If he was not 100% God, he would not qualify to make the legal deal. Because that's exactly what he was doing by giving his blood in place of yours. He was making a deal for your life. I like, too, the fact that in Revelation is pictured the bride. Thank you, Eric, for bringing everybody up or getting ready for the end, because that's where we're going. Jesus is winning. Jesus is winning his bride when he gives his life on the cross. That is why gentlemen are always asked, are you willing to lay down your life for this woman? And I would ask today, woman, woman related to God, church today, are we willing to lay down our life for our man? Naomi comes back from Moab and she says, don't call me, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Because I have been, I've been stripped down to nothing. And I am bitter. Mara means bitterness. What, what, what do we feel about this world right now? Are we, are we happy to be living here? Are, 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 we, are we okay with the relationship that we have in this world today with the one who, like us, is created and like us has rebelled against God? He has led us into rebellion. Are we happy with that relationship? Or are you interested in being redeemed? Are you interested in being reconnected to the family from which you are? originally came. Well, then I, I, I can simply offer you the grace of God. I can, I, can, I, can, I can tell you that the good news right now, because he is the firstborn of the dead, he qualifies to fulfill the legal requirements necessary to reconnect you legally to the king of the universe himself. And that you would be brought back into being part of his family. Ruth and Obed, uh, Ruth and, I gave it away. Ruth and Boaz have a baby whose name was Obed. Obed has a baby with his wife whose name was Jesse. Jesse has several sons of which the most famous is David. So that's why when Bartimaeus was outside of Jericho, he yells out at the top of his voice because he doesn't have eyes, he cannot see, he can only hear, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. My friends, that should be the cry on all of our lips. Jesus, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed, great-great-grandson of Ruth. Have mercy on me. I want to be part of your family. I want to go to heaven with you. I want to see my father face to face. Jesus offers that to us. It's not possible to look at God in our current sinful state, but he promises we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and that we will be able to see our heavenly daddy face to face. Then we'll know why we look like we do. Because he made us that way. Then we'll know why everything has happened because he's going to answer all our questions. 
But we've got to get there. We've got to get there, and it's going to be a journey. And Jesus has promised. He said, I'm going to go back to my Father, and I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So this week, this week, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge us all. Let's pray, Holy Spirit, please walk closer with me so that I hear your voice, so that I see what you're doing, so that I speak your words, so that what I do reflects the fact that I'm beside you so that I get a better understanding of what it's going to be like to live face to face with my Father. Because we believe that our eternity begins when we accept the deal that God has given. You accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior from sin, my brothers and sisters, you begin your eternal life. It's begun. And he promised that even if you die, you will be resurrected because he's the firstborn of the dead. And you can be the nextborn of the dead. That's good news. That's good news. Because right now, the survey that I read this last week tells me that it, people in Santa Clarita do not care what you know and understand and in biblical terms as a Seventh-day Adventist. They don't care. So if you thought that they should, I'm just letting you know. They don't care. That you go to church on Saturday, they don't care. They just think you're strange. Okay? But when you help their grandmother in the hospital, or you do something that impacts their life directly that says, the God of heaven knows that you're alive and sent me to help you. That's when they know that you're connected to God. It's very simple. This week you'll have an opportunity to listen to the Holy Spirit and he's going to say, you're part of the family. Would you go do this for me? You'll have a choice at that moment whether you want to act like you're part of the family or not. You'll have a choice. And the more you listen, this is the cruel thing, and I've had this experience in my life, and I know you have too, the more you listen, the louder that voice gets, and the more interesting missions you will be sent on. Don't worry about what you'll have to say. Don't worry about what you're asked to do. Just do it. Just say the words that he gives you, and watch what happens. Because you will see and have the incredible experience of seeing what God is doing in this world and you will be right beside him when it happens. I guarantee you it's exciting. I guarantee you you will want more. It'll be like your next best drug. I want this to become the new cocaine for the Adventist church. What do you say? <laughs> Spirit infilled experiences that happen that you just have to have again because the last one was so amazing. Wouldn't that be amazing? We could be like David in Psalm uh, 89, which says, my soul yearns. I have, a, I have a Jones for being in the presence of God because I hate it. I hate it. I can't stand it when I'm out of his presence. It just doesn't feel right. God bless you all. May you feel that in your lives this week. May you feel his protection. May you know his uh, thrill in your life this week. Amen.